He asked me to talk with you about what floats my boat, what gets me to do what I do. I'm going to start by telling you why all I want to do is stay in bed with covers over my head. Let me tell you about the typical life of a university scientist. Everything that happens in our lab, we're responsible for. Not just the ideas, but raising the money. Every technician, every student, every postdoc, our own salaries, we have to raise it. That's a lot to carry on our backs. We're pretty much on our own. And in, in the best of times, the National Institutes of Health sends back four out of every five grant applications that it receives, unfunded. Now, amazingly enough, we can live with that. Actually, we consider that the good times. Because right now, they turn down nine out of 10 or worse. In fact, I have a colleague who sent an application to one of the major charities in the United States. She got a phone call to tell her that her grant scored number one out of 164 applications, and they weren't sure that they had the money to fund it. This is the only developing country in the world that is not raising its science budgets, where people who do what I do are fighting for their very survival. There are laboratories across this country that are closing down. Our brightest young people look at this and ask themselves, why would they want to do this? And on top of this, we have the shutdown. For science, this means the National Institutes of Health is closed. The National Science Foundation is closed. The grant-giving bodies of the Department of Defense are closed. No grants are being submitted. The review sessions to evaluate grants are canceled. And these sessions require bringing together 20 or 30 busy people to review these grants. So getting them going again is going to be very difficult, on top of all the human tragedies that are caused by this shutdown. So why do I do this? Well, let's start with our cancer work. Now, let's turn the slides on if we could. We work on a lot of horrible diseases. Top of the list is cancer. And one of the cancers we work on is one of the most deadly of all malignant brain tumors. These are cancers that kill people usually within six to nine months or so. Progress in treating them has been very poor. And we've discovered new molecular pathways that enable this work to go forward more quickly. They look really promising. But we don't have the time it's going to take the 15 or 20 years to develop these drugs. And more importantly, the people with these diseases don't have the time for normal approaches. So I've committed us to a different approach, approach that I call the Shot on Goal program to shorten the path to the clinic. And in this program, what we do is we develop new applications of known properties of existing drugs, and we discover new properties of existing drugs. Why? Because we already know they work in humans. The toxicology is done. The dosing and the pharmacokinetics are all done, which means that the number of years that it takes to get into a clinical trial is shortened enormously. The traditional approach, it might take 10 or 15 years from discovery to go to a clinical trial. With a shot on goal program, it may be one or two years. I'll show you one example. This is a picture of survival times in mice whose brains have been implanted with human glioblastoma cells, the most malignant of brain tumors. We let the tumors grow for three or four weeks, and then we start treatment. The black line shows you mice that are only treated with saline solution. The red line shows you mice that are treated with the frontline treatment for glioblastoma, which doesn't provide any benefit to these animals plus one of the drugs that we discovered. And you can see that the tumor growth is suppressed for two weeks of treatment, and when we stop treatment, instead of the tumors regrowing, they shrink and they shrink, and they continue shrinking. 
And the first tumors don't come back until 100 days after treatment. One of the mice in this pilot experiment, we didn't even see a tumor. Six months after treatment, we finally sacrificed the mouse to see what was going on. This is a pilot experiment. This is a drug that's already proved even better than that. It's a generic drug. We don't have to negotiate with any pharmaceutical companies. We can just go forward with this. This work is approached in a way that is unique to Rochester. Our colleagues, Hartmut Land and Helene McMurray at the medical school, like us, have discovered pathways that nobody else works on, that appear to be essential for many, many types of cancers. And the pathways they work on, the pathways that we work on, both seem amenable to these shot-on-goal approaches. We work with Dr. John Alfar in the Department of Orthopedics on developing new ways of treating peripheral nerve injuries, traumatic nerve injuries, gunshot wounds, crush injuries, that again look like we are able to greatly hasten the time of recovery. We work on some awful genetic diseases, particularly interested in a type of disease called a lysosomal storage disorder. A lysosome is a part of your cell that's involved in breaking down proteins and lipids to provide nutrients for the cell. A lot of people have mutations in enzymes that are necessary for these to work. If you only have one mutation, you're fine, but sometimes, Someone marries someone who has a mutation in the same enzyme. And some of the kids inherit two mutated genes. And their lives can be short and miserable. Very sick at birth, death within two years, none of them having anything like the quality of life that we would like for our children. So we approach this, too, with the Shot on Goal program. And we're going to show you three 10-second movies. That black blob at the top is a mouse, and if you could start at movie running, you'll see that mouse running around. I hope. There he goes. And showing normal mouse behavior. In the next slide, we're going to show you a mouse that has one of these diseases. And it is so... This mouse is 25 days old. It has about another two weeks to live. What I want you to pay attention to is that it doesn't move much. It's, when it moves, it shivers. Its weight support is very poor. So start the program. Start the movie. And there he is. Poor, sick little guy. Not, not a good quality of life. Not going to be a long life. So. Christopher Foltz and Nicole Scott, two of my graduate students, have discovered pathways, novel pathways involved in causing this damage. We have discovered drugs that prevent this damage. And this is one of our pilot experiments of a mouse treated with our first drug. So let's start that one. And this guy looks pretty good, looks pretty normal. This is also a drug that's already approved for human use. In this work, we've also discovered a lot of bad drugs. We've discovered drugs that look like they might make these diseases worse. And some of these drugs are already used to treat these kids, so that's a real concern. But we've also opened up the door to a problem of tremendous interest. If you carry a mutation, one mutation for these diseases, you might think you're normal, but we know that, for example, for one of these diseases called Gaucher disease, you have a six-fold increased risk of developing Parkinson's disease. It is the strongest genetic risk factor for Parkinson's disease. Why? Well, what we're testing now is the idea that it's exposure to these bad drugs. And I can tell by looking at you that there's quite a few of you in here who are taking some of the drugs that are on our bad hit list just by your age distribution in the audience. It's not just about drugs, it's also about cells. When my colleagues, Margo Mara Prochelle and Chris Prochelle, we've discovered cells that can restore function when we transplant them in chronic spinal cord injury that look like they might be useful in treating Parkinson's disease. So we're on the cusp of changing the way we treat horrible diseases. 
But given the challenges we face with federal funding, these treatments and cures will not come quickly. People will suffer and die needlessly. So I'd like to ask you to remember this one equation. Do you remember anything from what I've said? The velocity of scientific progress equals discovery times dollars. Well, these days we have to rewrite the equation. The velocity of scientific progress equals discovery times donations. And don't worry, the development office has assured me they're not going to corral you today here, but when they come to you, help us build the medicine of the 21st century.